from Millville, New Jersey, and reaching around the world. New Life World Outreach Ministries presents His Word of Power with Pastor Richard F. Myers. Join us in a time of joyful worship, anointed ministry, and dynamic preaching from one of our Sunday morning worship services. It happens here on His Word of Power. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. And you are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverance. Again, you're the everlasting, you are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not think you won't grow. his name oh God you just comfort those you protect the weak oh God you're so righteous in everything you do Lord we lift you up you're holy and righteous in all your works mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes Jesus I want to sing it again you are the everlasting God voices and drums and you are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not faint, you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like Yes, Jesus. 
Jesus. Power in the name of Jesus to 
break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Oh, let's sing it again. There's power. Oh, there is power. It's hard to find a place where you fit in. A place where you know you're accepted and loved. A place that you can call home and be yourself. We want you to have a place like that. Just saying.
Would you turn to your neighbor right now and tell them it's going to be an awesome service tonight? Turn back to them and tell them, I know you want to rip open the presents. Tell them, I know you probably want to stuff your face. But this is the night of the Lord, amen? And we want to celebrate that above everything else. Please say amen to that. And so during the week, make sure, or during the day and during tomorrow, the weekend, I guess, Monday, what's today? All day? Okay. Sunday, all day, today, and tomorrow, let's remember why we have Christmas. It's the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right, let's get our Bibles open this morning to Luke, the first chapter. Luke, the first chapter. We want to begin there at the 28th verse. Luke, the 12th chapter, beginning at the 28th verse. This is the story that we're celebrating this day. And tomorrow and the next day, this is the time right now whereby you and I are here as believers because of the event that took place today and then again during the Easter celebration. But as I began to read the story this year, God began to show me some things that I had not seen before. And as I began to see them, I knew that by sharing them with you, you will get an understanding and a hope for the great things that God is doing in our lives. So if you would there, in Luke, the first chapter, we're going to begin reading at the 28th verse. Luke, the, Luke, the first chapter, beginning at the 28th verse. And the late angel came in under her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Let's bow our heads. <coughs> Excuse me. Father, I thank you right now for this day. I thank you for the power of this day celebration. It's not Christmas gifts. It's not turkey dinners or ham dinners or whatever dinners. But God, it is the day that we celebrate the fullness of the ramifications of man being sinful and being restored back to you through the birth of your son, which has become our Lord and Savior. And now, Father, as we look at your word, I ask that you would give me the confidence and the wisdom to put my words aside and allow your words to speak to the hearts of those who hear this message. I thank you for that now in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said amen, amen and amen. Here's something that's interesting. As I begin to read the story, I begin to read it differently than I have in many, many years. I've been reading it for a long, long time. What I began to realize was that this is the story of the divine. This is the story of the magnificence of God and the power of who he is in our lives every day. And we pick up this divine thing, this story of the divine, at the beginning where Gabriel, who is the archangel of God, is sent from heaven. Now imagine this. The archangel of God, the numero uno, number one angel, is sent to a little peasant girl by the name of Mary. Can you imagine that God would look down on an individual and see her with such favor that he would disperse from heaven his number one angel to bring a message to her that would eventually be the message of hope for you and I. And so we find this girl, Mary, who is a little girl, 
unbeknownst to anyone probably in the neighborhood, and he comes to make this first announcement to her to tell her, you have been chosen by God to do something that no one else has ever done. Do you know what's amazing about that statement? That God is still doing that in the lives of believers today. He's still saying to you and to you and to you and you, he's still saying, I want you to do something for me that no one else can do and nobody else has done. It is your responsibility because you have found favor with me. So the first thing that we see here, we see the archangel coming on the scene and beginning to talk to, to Mary, and it is Gabriel who is there and says to her, you have found favor with God, and we are now about to partake of something that has never, ever been seen in the history of mankind. So what do we have first? We have a divine intervention. It's the first one we've seen in the history of the world where some young girl, unbeknownst to anyone else, living a, you know, a, a normal, solitary life like the rest of us, and God comes on the scene with this divine intervention and announces to Mary, you're going to get pregnant, you're going to have a baby, you're not going to know a man, and it's going to be the Son of God. My goodness, what a divine intervention that must be. And imagine today how many times God has intervened divinely for you and you didn't even know it. There's been times when God has intervened miraculously and, in, and intervened, and we've called it a coincidence, or we've been smart enough to say, thank you, God, you saved my life. Thank you, God, you spared me. Thank you, God, you protected me. Thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. And it's the same reason that Mary was part of this divine intervention. It's because... As a believer in Christ, you have found favor with God. You haven't quite found as much favor as I have because I'm the apple of his eye, but he likes you too. Verse 30 tells us that the angel announces to her, you found favor with God. As I read that, I can't imagine... How did she find favor with God? We'd never heard of her before. She hadn't done any great exploits. She hadn't been in the front pages of the, New, of the Jerusalem Times about all of her, you know, charity work and all of her compassion work. Here she is, a little girl who has found favor with God. And the only thing that I can imagine that would cause God to have such favor towards her is what God said about David. He's a man after my own heart. I would imagine she was a woman who loved God and loved, her, loved him enough that she found favor with him. So we have this divine intervention starting to take place. This divine intervention is God intervening into the natural laws of man to bring about a supernatural manifestation. God, through a divine intervention, comes on the scene and says, I'm going to turn around the natural laws of this world, and I'm going to invoke a supernatural law that allows me the privilege of stepping into natural law and changing it and superseding it with the laws of the kingdom of God. And the good news is he's still willing to do that for you and I today. You and I can find ourselves into some serious situations and God is still willing to create a divine intervention without any help from anybody else, only by his hand extended to us. The problem is that most of us have forgotten that God is the God of divine intervention and that we are still forgetting about He's watching out for us and you, and he's willing to do things 
that you cannot imagine he's willing to do. Over the years, and especially certain Christmases that I look back over our lives, I remember where things were really difficult, things were really tight. And we didn't know what was going to happen during the Christmas season. And God sent people unbeknownst to us and, and ministered to us right up till the midnight hour. In fact, on the December the 24th evening, God blessed us one year through a divine intervention. We had no idea. In fact, somebody had given us some money, and we had went out into the shopping malls to buy Christmas gifts for each other, and we couldn't buy anything, nothing. And everything we looked at, God gave us a check. And everything we went to purchase, God said no. And every time we reached out to do something, God would say, no, not that. And it wound up the next day that everything that we were looking for and thought we needed for, to give to each other, the next day was under the tree for us. Every gift that we thought we would give each other was under that Christmas tree given to us by divine intervention. And one of the things that we looked at while we were out looking for little gifts for each other was a garlic press. Do you remember that? A garlic press. You know what the very last gift that we opened was? No, it was a $100 bill. Yes, of course it was a garlic press. It was a garlic press to show us that God had divinely intervened for us and that he is willing today to set up divine interventions for every situation, every circumstance that we experience in our lives, and he's willing to do it today, now, and forever. He's on your side. Would you please tell somebody, he's on your side. And he has divine interventions waiting for you. But you have a part. There's an interesting thing about this story. As I began to read, and God was speaking to me about these divine interventions, and he said, you know, I am ready to release these interventions on behalf of all my children if they will just do one thing. I said, Lord, we only have to do one thing? He said, yes. I said, well, what is it? He said, read your Bible, you'll find out. Don't you hate that? Don't you like it when somebody just tells you what God wants to say or God wants to do? It makes it so much easier. So I searched the whole week, and I found out how the divine intervention of the supernatural overpowered the natural, that the laws of this world were superseded by the law of God, and it all came out of one thing. Look there in your Bibles with me. In the same, same chapter that we're looking at, go all the way over to verse 38. In verse 38, Mary said something that instituted the permission for God to divinely intervene. After the angel had spoken to her, after he had told her she was highly favored, and it, you know, it welled up inside of her, and she was fearful, and the angel talked to her, and everything else, after the whole thing is done, in verse 38, we see a key. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Listen to what it says. Mary said, be it unto me according to thy word. And the moment she said that, the angel departed. She's still not pregnant because she hasn't been overshadowed yet by the Holy Spirit. The announcement has been made. The divine intervention has been set up. The only thing that would allow that divine intervention to manifest itself in her life for all of mankind was those words, be it unto me according to thy will, according to thy word. You see, up to this point, 
everything that the angel had said was only God's intention. It wasn't an intervention till she submitted her will and gave approval. The moment she said, be it unto me according to thy will, she opened the door for the divine intervention and God could fulfill, could fulfill his plan to bring the Son of God into human form through a impregnated young woman who knew no man. But he couldn't do that until she said, be it done unto me according to thy will. See, because surrendering our will for his word opens the possibility for divine intervention from God. Somebody say amen. amen. And all it took for her was a surrendering of her will to see the miraculous thing done that no one had ever seen before. In fact, later on, we'll, we'll explore the shepherds out in the field, but the amazing thing about it, they even say, we got to go see this thing that has been done. Why? Because it had never been done before. It had never happened before. There had never been a divine intervention to this magnitude that supersede all the laws of this world and bring the world and the kingdom and the principles and the laws of God into this world and superseded them. And it all happened because of one thing. Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Be it unto me according to thy word. I wonder how many times God has wanted to inter intervene on our part. He wanted to do a supernatural intervention. A and we didn't say, be it unto me according to your word. We got scared. We were fearful. We didn't think it was God speaking. We thought it was our own thought process. We thought it was our own mind. We thought, we thought, we thought. But in reality, it was God setting us up for this divine intervention. And all he was waiting for was for you or I to say, go ahead and do it, God. I surrender my will to you. Wow. Now you got this little girl who has just had a divine intervention from God himself. I mean, this is not an intervention for drug use, alcoholism. It's not one of those TV reality shows. This is from another dimension completely where God himself comes and intervenes. Man, I can't imagine what she must have felt like when the angel departed. She had given God the permission to do what he wanted to do, to use her body and to do something that had consequences with it. Because every time God wants to do something in our lives, there are consequences attached. I can't imagine what that young girl must have thought. I can't imagine when now she becomes pregnant, has never known a man, and she is now pregnant by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, and now she's got to go tell the man that she's betrothed to. She's got to go tell Joseph, who now wants to marry her, and they're set up to be married, that, hey, I'm pregnant. I bet you there's a lot of young people who wish for more divine interventions. I'm pregnant. She goes and tells Joseph, I don't know. I love my wife a lot. I mean, with all my heart, I love her. I can't imagine what my reaction would be if she came to me before we got married and said, baby, well, I'm sorry. She, she would say to me, hey, hunk of hunk of burning love. <laughs> I just wanted to tell you I'm pregnant, but I haven't been with another man. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine the thought process that this young man 
must have had to go through? I know that he went through something because he was willing to put her away privately. In other words, he wasn't going to go through with the deal. He was just going to take care of it, put her away, walk away from the deal until, until an angel shows up at his house. Look over in Matthew with me. In Matthew, and hold your place because we're going to come right back here in just a minute. Over in Matthew, the first chapter, I want you to look there with me at the 18th verse. In Matthew, the 18, or the, in Matthew, the first chapter, in the 18th verse, here's the story as it sets up. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Whereas his mother, Mary, was espoused to Joseph before they came together. In other words, before they were intimate, and she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. She has now been overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. 19th verse. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and that son shall be called, his name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So now we have an a divine intervention on Mary's behalf, and that same intervention begins to spill over into Joseph, who is now willing to put her away privately so not to publicly shame her. Every time God does a divine intervention in our lives, it will always spill over on someone else. Somebody say amen, please. You can't have an experience of divine nature with God and it not affect somebody else. When you got saved and you had a divine intervention into your sinful man, you told people, man, I accepted Jesus. You could not keep it to yourself. It spilled over. It will always spill over when there is a divine intervention. But now we enter the second phase. Joseph now has a divine intervention by the angel of the Lord that comes and tells him the same thing his potential wife just told him. I'm pregnant. I've been overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. Now the angel of the Lord comes and says, don't be worried. Fear not. Go ahead and take her. So accompanying the divine intervention was divine instruction. God will always give you instruction after he has, or right before, he has intervened into your life in some supernatural way. He will always tell you what to do. He will always give you. He will always give you some information that you need to have. It usually follows the divine intervention. He'll usually tell you what you need to do with what you got. He did that when you got saved. He told you who to tell. He told you to shout it from the housetops. He told you who to share it with. And that spilled over into other people's lives. And they experienced the same thing that you experienced. And so here we have Joseph. And now he has a divine uh, interact, intervention with the angel too. But he also has divine instruction. Notice some characteristics about this guy. In verse number 19, it says that Joseph was a just man. He was a fair, he was an honorable man. And even though his wife told him, or his future wife-to-be, tells him some outlandish story about being overshadowed by the Holy Spirit that is beyond his comprehension, he was a just and faithful man, and he wasn't going to make a public display of her. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, he says these words, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. Joseph now becomes not only an instructed person, individual, he now becomes an obedient individual. 
He now gets up and does exactly what the angel of the Lord tells him to do. So here's what happens now. Because of the divine intervention and the divine instruction, he now changes and from an ordinary man becomes an obedient man. He now puts himself in the place where the divine intervention can manifest in his life and change his life forever and ever and ever. Please say amen. In fact, I wrote this morning, through a simple act of obedience and possibly without understanding, it takes him from a place of obscurity to everlasting notoriety. Anybody ask, who was Mary's husband? We know. It was Joseph. Who's the earthly father of the Son of God? It was Joseph. Two obscure people now put into a place that their name and their act of obedience would be remembered forever. Forever and ever and ever and ever. I wrote this down. One act of obedience takes him from obscurity to everlasting notoriety. Man, I can't imagine what that must be like. I imagine, because I know what the Word of God says, that he didn't even know. He didn't even know that his name would live forever in the Word of God. All he knew was there was a divine intervention in his life. And by his act, just like Mary's act of obedience, he became part of the encounter of the greatest thing history has ever known. Can you imagine today can you imagine today what God is waiting for for you? Can you imagine today what God could possibly do if you and I would just say to God, God, whatever your will for my life is, I surrender. Whatever purpose you have for me, regardless of my ambitions, regardless of my dreams and my goals and all the things that I want to happen in my life, God... I surrender those all. I can remember when I was 30 years old. 30 years old, I was a vice president, partner in a major Madison Avenue, New York advertising agency. We were on the way up. I had a goal. At that point, that by the time I reached 35, I would be a multimillionaire. And we were progressing on that. The agency had picked up major clients. We were traveling all over the world, hanging out with movie stars, doing all kinds of crazy stuff, eating at the best restaurants, having the best, you know, uh, hotel rooms. I can remember one hotel room alone was a, a, a room for one person. It was two stories, had four balconies, had four bathrooms, a bedroom, a full living room, and concierge service and butler service and everything else. Had it all. And I was well on the way of becoming a millionaire by the time I was 35. And God got a hold of me and he said, your choice. You can serve me, or you can continue on. And God changed our lives, Helen and my life. And that day, when we surrendered our will, and we said, not our will be done, but your will be done, 
we became instant millionaires. Oh, not financially anymore, because that didn't have the significance that it once did. We became millionaires in joy and hope and promise and healing. We became millionaires in the shedding abroad of God's love on our hearts. We became millionaires in our relationship with each other, and we enjoyed a, a new dimension of hope and love and promise with each other. And we became millionaires in things that nobody else could, money couldn't buy. We became millionaires when we got prognosis from, doc, from doctors that said we're going to die. The millionaire promise of God was we're healed by the stripes of Jesus. When it looked like we were going to fall and fail because the money wasn't there, we were millionaires because our resources were not dependent upon what was in our bank account or in our pockets, but was dependent on the home country to which we now belonged. And at any time in our lives, we could invoke through the divine intervention and the divine instruction. And that instruction comes from the Word of God because the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And the moment we recognize that when we surrender our will, we put ourselves in a place of divine intervention for divine instruction for divine manifestation of what God has promised us. And it's simply done by the same two ways that Mary and Joseph did it. Be it unto me according to thy word. Bow your heads with me. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Next week, I want to pick up where we left off. I had another plan for next week, the last day of the week, or the last day of Sunday of the year. But God gave me so much stuff on this little simple story of divine instruction and divine connection that I want to share the rest of it with you next week. Father, I thank you today. I thank you, God, for the reality of the divine. That, Father, as we're studying in these two Sundays, the birth of Jesus Christ. We are looking past the natural realm and we are looking at the story of the divine. And already we have learned of the divine intervention that is available to us who call you Father. We are aware now of the divine instruction that you have designed for us to give us the things that we need to know. You have said in your word that you send the Holy Spirit to teach us all things, to show us things to come. And that, Father, that's the divine instruction you've promised us that is now being manifested in the New Testament of your blood. And so I thank you today, God, that as we've heard this simple message, we have moved from the natural into the supernatural. We have moved from the carnal into the divine, and we have now been placed in a position that we can unlock and release the supernatural intervention and supernatural instruction of the God of all creation to one of his children. And it is the simple act that releases that of saying, be it unto me according to thy word. For that I thank you and give you glory in Jesus' name. Your head's still bowed, your eyes are still closed. Maybe somebody's here this morning and you've never met Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
And maybe you want to put yourself this morning in a position and a place where God can do things for you that supersede the natural laws of this world and this earth. Maybe you're here this morning and you used to know him and somehow you got hurt, you got wounded. Somehow something upset you and sent you away or life took hold of you and caused you to put all your efforts in survival and ladder climbing the ladder of success. But today, you heard just a simple thing about divine intervention and divine instruction. And now your heart is yearning to be in that place where Mary and Joseph were with the opportunity to say, be it unto me according to thy word. And so if you're here this morning, the word of God for you today is, ask Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life. The word of God for you today is come back home where you belong if you've backslidden, if you've left this ark of safety. And so I want to pray one final prayer before we close the service. And I want to pray for anyone here today, right now, who fits the category of you want divine intervention in your life because you want to accept Christ or because you walked away was hurt, wounded, or whatever, and you're ready to come back, and you want to be in this final prayer to reestablish or to create a personal relationship with the God of all creation, the Father God, the Father of Jesus, and the Savior of you. So if you're here right now, and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, or you did, but somehow you got pulled away and you want to be included in this prayer, would you just slip your hand up right now quickly? I'll see it. I'll see it. Thank you. I'll see it. Anyone? Anyone else right here? Who else? Someone else? You want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. You want this day to be the day that it happens for you. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for the decision this young one made today. I thank you that it is a reality and not just something he has done, but today he meets you in a special way. We give you glory for that now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Would you stand up to your feet with me? Hi, this is Pastor Myers. I wanted to let you know our church family would love to have you join us here in the sanctuary for one of our weekly services. Every Sunday morning, we have dynamic worship, powerful preaching, an awesome children's church, and we see the power of God as he ministers to his family. Those services begin at 11 a.m. Then on Wednesday nights, we have ministries for the entire family. We have adult worship and Bible study, Royal Rangers for the boys and G3 for the girls. It's a night packed with the presence and power of God and it happens at 7.15 every Wednesday evening. If you'd like more information about New Life Church, you can go to our website at newlifeoutreach.org. There you'll find all the information you need to be part of a great church. Well, until our family meets your family on our next broadcast, may God richly bless you and yours. We've been here for 27 years, Helen and I. Uh, we came in 1986. 23 years. 32 years. It's either 10 or 11 years, I think. For 12 years. Uh, 22 years. 26 years. 26 and a half years. There were times when you hear the echoes in the building because of the lack of people. We had about 70 people and a whole lot of debt. Um, it was a little bit different than other churches that I've been to. Uh, got stretched a lot in the beginning. <laughs> the prayer path was still here. 
was a wild pastor that would dance all over the pews and jump from pew to pew. We had no TV ministry back then. Oh man, I was scared, man. <laughs> I was scared, bro. I was nervous. I didn't know what to expect. Wade Keller around the table at ministry. We've grown from 70 families to about 500 uh, members now. I'm stretching. Much spiritual growth, a real impartation. Uh, change, growth, and some more stretching. We've seen tremendous moves of the Holy Spirit. We've seen God do amazing things. So we saw a great growth spurt. Uh, we've teamed up our missions uh, programs with Apostle Rosemond Romney in the Caribbean and Dr. Mike Panjo in Ohio. I felt like I was accepted where I was at each stage of my life. And some stretching. We're in a paradigm shift right now. And now God is bringing us to a new realm where He's asking us to be a door for people to come and find Him. It's exciting, an exciting time. You see, you know, people growing to the place where they can step into their ministries. We've got this new element that we want to accept you where you are and value where you are and who you are and then love you enough to take you to a higher place. There's a, 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 a renewed fire, it's growing. And like I said, there's an expectancy here. It, and it's curiosity, but in a good way. Now you see the growth of the people that's coming in the house of worship. And that's a blessing in, in itself. There's a strong message of the Father's love and the grace of God coming forth. That's a question that we really uh, had to ask ourselves because so many churches you know, claim special things. People gravitate here of different backgrounds and races. The freshness, it's not... Um, starchy, it's not religious, always alive and, and exciting. Very cutting edge. We worship hard, man. It's bringing people from everywhere. The church is the most segregated place. We were the only church in this entire community that was multiracial. And I just love what I see and sense and, and it's beautiful.